Hey everybody, and welcome back to Virtual Berlin Tours with me, Nick Jackson. Got an epic story uh, from Berlin for you today. I'm sure you're aware of the idea that in the last thousands of years, um, as long as stories have been written down, there's only really uh, a handful of basic storylines um, that all of those stories encompass. And I reckon two of the favorites would be the idea of the plucky outlaw stealing from the man, stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. Perhaps the best example of that would be Robin Hood. Or who hasn't dreamt of buried treasure? Imagine that, finding free riches to set you up for life. Maybe the story of Treasure Island, possibly even Indiana Jones, all right? But this story I'm gonna tell you today involves both of those storylines and it relates to the beginning of the story um, to this district that I'm standing in now. This is a place called Moabit. It was in West Berlin. And in the 1800s, as the Industrial Revolution arrived in Berlin, the locals were christened this area Terra de Fuego. It became a working class residential suburb because here were built the great factory complexes of the late 1880s, 1890s, Siemens, AEG, and all the rest of them. And as a result of all the flaming and smoking chimneys, the local population would call this place Terra de Fuego. But one of those working families was called the Zass family. Mr. Zass was a tailor, Mrs. Zass was a washerwoman, and they had five children. The youngest of two were called Eric and Franz, and they went down in Berlin folklore as the Berlin Robin Hoods, and they were born. And our story starts in this house here. Now, the Zass family were pretty poor. All seven of them lived in a one-room apartment. So there must have been quite a lot of, you kids, says Mum Zass, get out there and play, get out from under my feet. They could have gone to the Westhafen a few hundred metres away. It's a big canal harbour area. Maybe they checked that out. Maybe they watched outside the big brewery complex now, a kind of a leisure facility that lies behind those trees. Or maybe they came here. Remember, 200 years ago, this area was just meadows. As it got developed for industrial zones and housing, this strip was left as a mini version of Berlin's famous central park, the Tiergarten. Hence the name, the Kleiner Tiergarten, the Small Tiergarten. Still a place with quite a lot of action going on on a daily basis in Moabit um, today. But they were already known, the boys, the two brothers, Franz and Eric, to social services and the uh, police because of minor misdemeanors. You can imagine uh, minor misdemeanors they committed when they were young. But as they hit their early teens, World War I takes place, and when they reach the end of their teens, they're expected to begin their adult lives after World War I the political, social and economic world uh, of Germany collapsed. The Kaiser got booted out, the Emperor. Germany sees its first democracy. They have to sign the Treaty of Versailles. Everyone has to deal with the shame and trauma of uh, the defeat in World War I. It produces the revolution for a year, with hundreds of people being killed on the streets of Berlin and other towns to the left, battling out for the right. And it would be within that atmosphere that the two brothers thought, you know, we've been betrayed by the world, and they'd go into a more, should we say, self-sufficient uh, view of their future. And they decide that they're going to go and take the money they felt that they deserved um, from the man, if you like. Um, they decide to go into what they call banking. They'll become bank robbers, Specifically, they were going to be Berlin's um, most famous safe crackers. Now, the 1920s was also a time for modernization and innovation. And, um, in fact, at the same time uh, um, the brothers Ass were born, a patent had been written, early 1900s, 1903, for the development of a new type of welding and metal cutting uh, um, machinery, and that thing was an oxyacetylene torch. So they decided to put these two things together. And in 1924, they made their attempt to buy the gas bottles and an oxyacetylene torch so that they could use it to cut open the safes of the banks in what is now Western Berlin. That attempt to buy the torch became known to the police, so they're back on the radar, but in a much more serious way. But were the brothers asked, uh, um, deterred? No, they weren't. And um, they managed to get hold of the equipment, and by 1927, they start planning, uh, quite carefully, their first raid. And that first bank raid was just down the road. Let's go down and find out what happened. So on the 27th of March, 1927, three years after they made their first attempt to get hold of the gas bottles and torches to begin this um, safe cutting career, um, the Brothers Ass went for this before it was an Italian restaurant. It was the Berliner Bank. They were um, very careful in their planning, as you'll hear, and they obviously had some kind of personality traits that suited um, the gaining of information they'd need for these daring raids. They were obviously sort of quite, quite likeable, cheeky um, Berlin chappies, if you like. And perhaps it was that that gave them um, connections within uh, um, society, um, things like watchmen and various other um, workers, that got them insider information that would aid their um, attempts to get inside the bank. 
But 27th of March, 1927, they got inside this, the Berliner the Bank. They were halfway through cutting the door um, to the safe um, when they were overcome by fumes. So this is a result of their inexperience. It's either one of two things. Either the flames from the torch consumed all the oxygen within the room and they were then being poisoned slowly by conceivably carbon monoxide, or just the fact they didn't have any oxygen, meaning they had to abandon the attempt. Or, if you ever wondered how an oxyacetylene torch works, when it cuts metal, it's not melting it, it oxidizes it, it sublimates it, it goes from the metal, from a solid to a gaseous form in the heat of these gas jets. As that um, chemical process takes place, it releases chemicals, noxious and otherwise, depending on what the safe is made of, depending on the metal compounds. And it was probably one of those two things that meant that the uh, robbery had to be abandoned. But when the alarm is raised and the police arrive, they put two and two together and think, these brothers Zass were trying to buy this equipment, now we can see it's probably them and what they're going to do with it. And it began a two year cat and mouse as the police were always one step behind the Zass brothers. It wasn't the fact that the police didn't know that these Zass brothers were planning and executing these uh, um, robberies. It was finding the evidence to arrest and convict them that turns into the problem. Uh, and that proves as a result of the Zass brothers kind of panache um, and their planning much harder uh, than you'd assume. They didn't stop here, they didn't give up. They started on a whole series in 1927, 1928, and one of the most daring was just down this road. Now, far from being deterred by their initial failure at the end of March 1927, the brothers went into a series of three other raids um, late in 1927, and the first was against the Dresdner Bank down in Savini Platz. Now, the problem with their initial first failure was that the police were onto them. So their flat was being surveilled, warrants were produced to search it, but they were very careful, um, so the police had no evidence to bring them in, arrest them, and convict them for this initial uh, robbery attempt. But in their careful preparations prior to the robbing of the Dresdner and a bank on Savini Platz, they realised that the police were onto them and had staked the place out and that robbery had to be abandoned. Then they went for the wages of the Imperial German Railway at the um, Imperial German Railway, the Reichbahn headquarters building um, at a place called Gleis Dreieck. This time they had to tunnel in from a place outside, building a trap so that, that was so well um, camouflaged that no one noticed it for the two days it took them to build the tunnel into the building but a night watchman disturbed them during the raid itself, that raid had to be abandoned as well. Uh, and then, um, down on near the famous Kurfürsten Boulevard in the heart of West Berlin, they planned another bank robbery, but that was rumbled by the smell of burning. They were halfway through cutting the safe open. Um, a local passerby, local passerby smelled a smell of burning, called the fire brigade. They and the police turned up, and as they went into the building to put out the fire, they realised the robbery had been in progress, but the brothers of Sass were nowhere to be found. They seemed to have vanished into thin air. What have they done? They torched their way through a wall into a cellar and had obviously staked the place out well enough to know what their escape routes were. Police found it inexplicable, but the brothers um, Zass were long gone. And then they thought by March of 1928, no mucking around, now we're going to go for the big one. So they came here. Now this building used to be the state finance office. Today it's the government quarter for modern Berlin, the German capital's fire brigade headquarters. In fact, this building behind me where those trees are, that is part of Angela Merkel, the current chancellor's chancery complex, and the Reichstag, the famous parliament building, is just over here to the right. But remember the Treaty of Versailles after World War I? Germany had to pay millions in reparations. On March the 28th, 1928, inside that building, Building were nine million Reichmarks in cash and the brothers Zass decided to go for that. They got into the building, um, they got into the safe room, but it was alarmed and Eric Zass was seen by one of the vigilant watchmen as he cut the alarm wire and they had to not just abandon it and run, and not just that, they had to leave their gas bottles and their oxyacetylene torches behind. Again, and indicated to the police that this was the work of Eric and Franz Zass. But even then they weren't deterred, and by January of 1929, they were ready to go for the big one. The robbery that put them into Berlin folklore, um, a robbery um, with a story that still reverberates even today. And that was down near the famous department store, the KDV, on the great boulevard of West Berlin, the famous Kurfürsten Dam, and that is where we're gonna go now. Now down on the Wittenberg Platz, you have the famous late 1800s Boulevard, the famous Kurfürsten Dam still with all the glitzy shops. You've got the KDV, Berlin's most upmarket department store. But behind me where this modern building stands, this used to be the Disconto Bank Gesellschaft, the Disconto Bank. And here there was a room with 181 private safety deposit boxes for the valuables and the jewellery, etc. of the upper middle class wealthy folks 
um, that used to live around this, one of Berlin's most fashionable squares. In fact, Hermann Goering, one of Hitler's closest confederates, very keen on his food, his favourite restaurant, Porsche's, was here on that square. Now, the brothers Ass had been unlucky in their series of robberies before. They'd been rumbled by the cops who were on their tail um, through, that, uh, through the year 1927, 1928. But they'd learned from all their experiences. All they needed was their luck to hold out. And this was where they would hit the jackpot. So this tunneling idea, they, and how they found out this information uh, is uh, rather interesting. They find out that the safety deposit vault um, was um, connected to a ventilation shaft. And that ventilation shaft ran near a cellar of the house next door. So they got access to the cellar, tunnel into the ventilation shaft to give them access to the safety deposit box room. They then ransacked the place, leaving only two of those uh, boxes unopened. And in there, they found, according to the police, 150,000 Reich marks of gold, jewellery, cash, bank bonds, <coughs> shares, various other material. People uh, who worked at the bank arrived the day after the robbery. They found they couldn't open the door. They then spent two days with building workers smashing through the wall of the vault. And when they got in, they realised A, it had been robbed and ransacked, and B, the reason they couldn't get in is that the brothers Zass had welded the, door, the bank vault door shut from the inside. But that 48 hours gave them time to get away, to stash their treasure. But it had the signatures of the Zass brothers all over it, and the police get a warrant to raid the apartment and arrest um, Eric and Frank. With the lack of evidence, they got a problem holding them, so they had to be released. And in true cheeky brothers ass fashion, they then held at one of Berlin's most fashionable restaurants, Lutter and Wegner on John Darman Marks, with the crowd thronged with well wishers and fans outside, a press conference celebrating their release and enjoying the celebrity that had been caused by this fantastic robbery. Now, the actual department of the police who were after um, Eric and Frank and Sass um, was the so called Cripo or Kriminalpolizei, Criminal Police. And they had a young, very modern, ambitious commissar um, who was assigned uh, uh, the case over these years that we've been talking about and his name was Max Farbisch. Um, now as we already heard um, he had already put Farbisch two and two together and knew about the um, Zass's uh, robberies but he never find the evidence to convict them. And even after the Bonanza raid in January of 1929, um, the brothers had to be released because no incriminating evidence was found on them um, at, nor um, in the apartment uh, that was raided. But um, a hot tip came in, um, which was about as close as Farbish would come to finding the evidence to convict. And that would take place here at the Louisen Friedhof, the Louisen Cemetery in Charlottenburg. So some curtain twitcher, um, some nosy neighbour um, noticed some sort of nighttime activity here in the cemetery. Um, and if you look at the pictures from the time, um, all of this action would take place up against one of the boundary walls. Now, one of the problems you have uh, in Berlin, of course, is the damage caused by World War II. But all along this side of the cemetery, for the perimeter, um, the wall has um, brick buttresses. It's a brick wall. Um, in some cases, the wall is gone. But this brick wall here, behind on this tomb, looks roughly the place uh, um, where, in the photos, you can see the police having investigated this area. So, what happened? Nighttime activity, something illicit is going on in the graveyard, you better get down and check it out. The police come and they find freshly turned earth. And as they start to investigate, they realise that under this freshly turned up sand, as it is in Berlin, um, were boards. And when they open the boards, they find the entrance to an underground den. Now, all of your famous bank robbers got to have an underground den, right? So the, the Sass brothers seem to have constructed a three-room, all shored up with wood, a three-room underground den where they could A, hide, and B, stash all of their bulky equipment, which is why, of course, when Farbish raided their apartment, he never found the evidence he needed to hold, uh, prosecute, and convict. But having discovered this um, three-room underground hideout with all the material, the police decide to stake it out and wait and see what happens. And sure enough, a few nights later, over the wall climbs a figure. And when it's challenged, it turns out to be um, Franz Zass. He runs, he vaults over the wall where Eric seems to have been waiting, and they run immediately to their lawyer, who then, when the police catch up with them a few hours later, um, gave them an alibi. Oh, no, no, he couldn't have been at the cemetery. They were both with me um, during that time. So again, they have to be released. Now for the final chapter of our story, we've come here deep in the Grunewald Forest on the western side of Berlin to the Grunewald Forest Cemetery. 
Um, perhaps one of the most famous people buried in here is a woman called Krista Pefkin. Uh, she died in uh, the late 1980s on a cycling holiday in Ibiza, but she was better known as the actress, the model, the musician, friend of Andy Warhol, friend of Lou Reed, played on the famous Velvet Underground Banana album. Um, she's buried in here. But we're deep in the middle of the forest, uh, and this is the place where our story um, uh, comes to an end. After the brothers were arrested and then released on the lack of evidence after the robbery in 1929 and they hurled their cheeky and famous press conference, um, Farbish doesn't seem to have uh, uh, given up. He still can't find the evidence he needs, so the brothers seem to have laid low. But the question is, what do they do with all of this stuff that they'd stolen from these safety deposit boxes? And until the end of his days, Farbish, who after the robbery seems to have kept um, um, snooping after the, uh, the brothers, claimed until the end of his days that he saw them jumping over the wall of the Grunewald Cemetery with a shovel shortly after the um, hullabaloo had kind of like settled um, after this robbery, so sometime early 1930s. Um, that would make sense when you think that they had the underground den, Eric and France, in the Louisan Cemetery um, in Charlottenburg, which is quite central. You know, what better place, if you're a kind of a fan of cemeteries, as places to stash your stuff, treasure or otherwise, than this um, forest cemetery in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Even today, um, very rarely, um, people actually make it here. Either way, um, the treasure was never found and there is still um, an association um, in Berlin for people who, during their free time, scour this, this area around the cemetery still looking for the treasure. Now there's discrepancies as to what was actually in the treasure. The official police report was 150,000 Reichmarks worth of stuff. Now these people who had their stuff stolen, um, these are wealthy individuals who probably weren't that forthcoming with exactly what was in their safety deposit boxes. Maybe they're trying to hide it from the income tax authorities uh, or whatever. But even within police um, circles there seem to be rumours that the actual amount uh, of money that the um, uh, Eric and Franz stole was much higher than the 150,000 um, official uh, tally. Some go up to as high as two million Reichmarks, which at the end of the 1920s was some real serious money. But um, there are also incredible things rumoured to have been within the things that they stole as well. What about this? Wagner's original score of Tristan and Isolde, or um, a load of uh, jewellery that belonged to the Sultan of Zanzibar. Both those things rumoured to be in this stuff that the brothers stole. Either way, in 1933, the case had gone cold, but something else had happened, and that was Germany had changed forever because Adolf Hitler and the Nazis had come to power. And in their horrendous, brutal approach of reorganizing uh, German society and uh, re-educating, as they would say, um, the members of the people's community that they uh, thought were unworthy of belonging um, to that people's community, um, concentration camps essentially are built for, as these correctional institutions, as the uh, Nazis would say, for this type of person. But one of the forgotten insignia on concentration camp uniforms was the Green Triangle, and Green Triangles were um, habitual criminals. So those folks who got busted a couple of times for whatever crime and got sent to jail, um, you kept doing it, you could be then transferred to a concentration camp as a Green Triangle prisoner. Now, Eric and Franz Zass were not just career criminals, they were famous career criminals, so they decided to up sticks and move to Denmark in 1933 when Hitler became Chancellor. Perhaps confirming that they'd stashed all their wealth somewhere here or elsewhere uh, in Berlin, um, they seemed to have run out of money, so they robbed a tobacco factory, they robbed a bank and eventually got busted and sent down for four years in separate jails um, for burglary, robbery and um, uh, falsification of documentation. But at the end of that sentence, or towards the end of that sentence, they were sent back to Berlin um, and were retried and were given an 11 and 13 year sentence respectively. But months after those uh, um, sentences were uh, given, um, rumour has under the personal order of Adolf Hitler, the brothers were taken to concentration camp Sachsenhausen, not as Green Triangle prisoners, simply to be shot um, in the industrial yard, where a few years later, Sachsenhausen would build its gas chamber and Station Z killing area responsible for the deaths of thousands and thousands of, uh, of prisoners and the burning of their bodies. Now the man who organised that shooting and claimed in his memoirs later that he was personally um, involved in the actual shooting itself um, was the commandant of um, the Sachsenhausen prisoner camp who a few weeks after the um, execution of the Zass brothers took place in his camp will be sent off to build another camp. And the name of the man who uh, organised the uh, shooting of the uh, Zass brothers was called Rudolf Hoss, and the name of the camp that he would then build beginning in 1940, then um, initially uh, an overflow prison in Poland, the name of that camp would be Auschwitz. So here's the walls of the cemetery, perhaps it was right there where 
Max Farbish saw Eric's ass jump over the wall and disappear into the forest with the shovel. And the story hasn't yet finished because somewhere out there is the treasure still hidden of the brother's ass. So the story, who knows, maybe one day they'll find it and the story of France and Eric's ass will come to an end. <laughs>